The Ascent of Mount Carmel by St. John of the Cross The Ascent of Mount Carmel Treats of how the soul may prepare itself in order to attain, in a short time, to divine union. Gives very profitable counsels and instruction, both to beginners and to proficients, that they may know how to disencumber themselves of all that is temporal, and not to encumber themselves with the spiritual, and to remain in complete detachment and liberty of spirit, as is necessary for divine union. Argument All the doctrine whereof I intend to treat in this ascent of Mount Carmel is included in the following stanzas, and in them is also described the manner of ascending to the summit of the mount, which is the highest state of perfection, which we here call union of the soul with God, and because I must continually base upon them that which I shall say, I have desired to set them down here together, to the end that all the substance of that which is to be written may be seen and comprehended together, although it will be fitting to set down each stanza separately before expounding it, and likewise the lines of each stanza, according as the matter and the exposition require. The poem, then, runs as follows stanzas, wherein the soul sings of the happy chance which it had in passing through the dark night of faith, in detachment of, and purgation of itself, to union with the beloved. On a dark night, kindled in love with yearnings, O oh, happy chance, I went forth without being observed, my house being now at rest. In darkness and secure, by the secret ladder, disguised, Oh, happy chance! In darkness and in concealment, my house being now at rest. In the happy night, in secret, when none saw me, nor I beheld aught, without light or guide, save that which burned in my heart. This light guided me more surely than the light of noonday to the place where he, well, I knew who, was awaiting me a place where none appeared. O oh, night that guided me, O oh, night more lovely than the dawn, O oh, night that joined beloved with lover, lover transformed in the beloved, upon my flowery breast, kept holy for himself alone. There he stayed sleeping, and I caressed him, and the fanning of the cedars made a breeze. The breeze blew from the turret as I parted his locks. With his gentle hand he wounded my neck and caused all my senses to be suspended. I remained lost in oblivion. My face I reclined on the beloved. All ceased, and I abandoned myself, leaving my cares forgotten among the lilies. En una noche escura Con ansias en amores inflamada, oh dichosa ventura, salí sin ser notada, estando ya mi casa sosegada. A oscuras y segura, con la secreta escala disfrazada, oh dichosa ventura, a oscuras y encelada, estando ya mi casa sosegada. En la noche dichosa, en secreto que ni aire me veía, ni yo miraba cosa, sin otra luz y guía, sino la que en el corazón ardía. Aquesta me guiaba, más cierto que la luz de mediodía, a donde me esperaba, quien yo bien me sabía, en parte donde naide parecía. Oh, noche que guiaste, oh, noche amable más que la alborada, oh, noche que juntaste amado con amada, amada en el amado transformada. En mi pecho florido, que entero para él solo se guardaba, allí quedó dormido, y yo le regalaba. Y el ventalle de cedros aire daba. 
el aire de la almena, cuando yo su cabella se esparcía, con su mano serena, en mi cuello hería, y todos mis sentidos suspendía. Quedéme y olvidéme, el rostro recliné sobre el mano. Cesó todo, y déjeme, dejando mi cuidado, entre las azucenas olvidado. Prologue In order to expound and describe this dark night through which the soul passes in order to attain to the divine light of the perfect union of the love of God, as far as is possible in this life, it would be necessary to have illumination of knowledge and experience other and far greater than mine. For this darkness and these trials, both spiritual and temporal, through which happy souls are wont to pass in order to be able to attain to this high estate of perfection, are so numerous and so profound that neither does human knowledge suffice for the understanding of them, nor experience for the description of them. For only he that passes this way can understand it, and even he cannot describe it. Therefore, in order to say a little about this dark night, I shall trust neither to experience nor to knowledge, since both may fail and deceive. But, while not omitting to make such use as I can of these two things, I shall avail myself in all that with the divine favor I have to say, or, at the least, in that which is most important and dark to the understanding, of divine scripture. For if we guide ourselves by this, we shall be unable to stray, since he who speaks therein is the Holy Spirit. And, if anything I stray, whether through my imperfect understanding of that which is said in it, or of matters uncollected with it, it is not my intention to depart from the sound sense and doctrine of our Holy Mother the Catholic Church. For in such a case I resign, submit and resign myself wholly, not only to her command, but to whatever better judgment she may pronounce concerning it. To this end I have been moved, not by any possibility that I see in myself of accomplishing so arduous a task, but by the confidence which I have in the Lord that he will help me to say something to relieve the great necessity which is experienced by many souls, who when they set out upon the road of virtue, and our Lord desires to bring them into this dark night that they may pass through it to divine union, make no progress. At times this is because they have no desire to enter it, or to allow themselves to be led into it. At other times, because they understand not themselves, and lack competent and alert directors who will guide them to the summit. And so it is sad to see many souls to whom God gives both aptitude and favor with which to make progress, and who, if they would take courage, could attain to this high estate, remaining in an elementary stage of communion with God, for want of will or knowledge, or because there is none who will lead them in the right path, or teach them how to get away from these beginnings. And at length, although our Lord grants them such favor as to make them go onward without this hindrance or that, they arrive at their goal very much later, and with greater labor, yet with less merit because they have not conformed themselves to God and allowed themselves to be brought freely into the pure and sure road of union. For although it is true that God is leading them and that he can lead them without their own help, they will not allow themselves to be led. And thus they make less progress, because they resist him who is leading them, and they have less merit, because they apply not their will and on this account they suffer more. For these are souls who, instead of committing themselves to God and making use of his help, rather hinder God by the indiscretion of their actions or by their resistance. Like children, 
who, when their mothers desire to carry them in their arms, start stamping and crying and insist upon being allowed to walk, with the result that they can make no progress, and, if they advance at all, it is only at the pace of a child. Wherefore, to the end that all, whether beginners or proficients, may know how to commit themselves to God's guidance when His Majesty desires to lead them onward, we shall give instruction and counsel by His help, so that they may be able to understand His will, or at the least, allow Him to lead them. For some confessors and spiritual fathers, having no light and experience concerning these roads, are wont to hinder and harm such souls, rather than help them on the road. They are like the builders of ba Babel, who, when told to furnish suitable material, gave and applied other very different material, because they understood not the language. And thus nothing was done. Wherefore it is a difficult and troublesome thing at such seasons for the soul not to understand itself, or to find none who understands it. For it will come to pass that God will lead the soul by a most lofty path of dark contemplation and aridity, wherein it seems to be lost. And being thus full of darkness and trials, constraints and temptations, will meet one who will speak to it, like Job's comforters, and say that it is suffering from melancholy, or low spirits, or morbid disposition, or that it may have some hidden sin, and that it is for this reason that God has forsaken it. Such comforters are wont to declare immediately that that soul must have been very evil, since such things as these are befalling it. And there will likewise be those who tell the soul to retrace its steps, since it is finding no pleasure or consolation in the things of God as it did aforetime. And in this way they double the poor soul's trials, for it may well be that the greatest affliction which it is feeling is that of knowledge of its own miseries, thinking that it sees itself more clearly than daylight to be full of evils and sins. For God gives it that light of knowledge in that night of contemplation, as we shall presently show. And when the soul finds someone whose opinion agrees with its own, and who says that these things must be due to its own fault, its affliction and trouble increase infinitely, and are wont to become more grievous than death. And not content with this, such confessors, thinking that these things proceed from sin, make these souls go over their lives, and cause them to make many general confessions, and crucify them afresh, not understanding that this may quite well not be the time for any of such things and that their penitence should be left in the state of purgation which God gives them, and be comforted and encouraged to desire it, until God be pleased to dispose otherwise. For until that time, no matter what the souls themselves may do, and their confessors may say, there is no remedy for them. This, with the divine favor, we shall consider hereafter, and also how the soul should conduct itself at such a time, and how the confessor must treat it, and what signs there will be whereby it may be known if this is the purgation of the soul. And in such case, whether it be of sense or of spirit, which is the dark night whereof we speak, and how it may be known if it be melancholy, depression, or some other imperfection with respect to sense or to spirit. For there may be some souls who will think, or whose confessors will think, that God is leading them along this road of the dark night of spiritual purgation, whereas they may possibly be suffering only from some of the per imperfections aforementioned. And again, there are many souls who think that they have no aptitude for prayer, when they have very much, and there are others who think they have much, when they have hardly any. There are other souls who labor and weary themselves to a piteous extent, and yet go backward, 
seeking profit in that which is not profitable, but is rather a hindrance. And there are still others who, by remaining at rest and in quietness, continue to make great progress. There are others who are hindered and disturbed and make no progress because of the very consolations and favors that God is granting them in order that they may make progress. And there are many other things on this road that befall those who follow it, both joys and afflictions and hopes and griefs, some proceeding from the spirit of perfection and others from imperfection. Of all these, with the divine favor, we shall endeavor to say something, so that each soul who reads this may be able to see something of the road that he ought to follow, if he aspire to attain to the summit of this mount. And since this introduction relates to the dark night through which the soul must go to God, let not the reader marvel if it seem to him somewhat dark also. This, I believe, will be so at the beginning when he begins to read. But as he passes on, he will find himself understanding the first part better, since one part will explain another. And then, if he read it a second time, I believe it will seem clearer to him, and the instruction will appear sounder. And if any persons find themselves disagreeing with this instruction, it will be due to my ignorance and poor style. For in itself the matter is good and of the first importance. But I think that even if it were written in a more excellent and perfect manner than it is, only the minority would profit by it. For we shall not here set down things that are very moral and delectable for all spiritual persons who desire to travel toward God by pleasant and delectable ways, solid and substantial instruction, as well suited to one kind of person as to another, if they desire to pass to the detachment of spirit which is here treated. Nor is my principal intent, intent to address all, but rather certain persons of our sacred order of Mount Carmel of the primitive observance, both friars and nuns, since they have desired me to do so to whom God is granting the favor of setting them on the road to this mount, who, as they are already detached from the temporal things of this world, will better understand the instruction concerning detachment of spirit. End of Prologue